Welcome to Dialogue Denver DA. Mitch, great to see you again. Good to see you, Tamara. You have a special person, a special uh, guest, somebody from your staff. Uh, who is this? Well, you know, I have a lot of deputies that work for us, and some are just deputies and some are chief deputies. And the chief deputies run units and they supervise people. So I have Don Weber here, and she's a chief deputy. She's actually responsible for two very important programs in our office, our cold case program, which is what I think we're going to talk about today mostly with forensic DNA. But she also now is in charge of our human trafficking program which we have just joined a task force in that and I think that's a whole nother show but it's great to have Don here. It is. Don, welcome. Thank you. Talk to us a little bit about how um, forensic DNA has changed the landscape of criminal investigations. Well I think Mr. Morrissey is probably in the best position to talk about the entire historical overview. I've been working with DNA related cases since 2006 and what I can say is that the prominence of this type of evidence um, just continues to grow. It used to be that there were only certain deputies in our office or certain trial attorneys who had the capability to understand the science behind this and also admit it during a trial, Mr. Morrissey of course being the first among them, and now it is in everyone's toolkit because of the prominence of this, uh, this evidence where we find biological evidence at a crime scene. It gets collected by members of the Denver Police Department and then examined and analyzed with testing results coming from our own lab at the Denver Police Department Crime Lab. And so we see it in a large percentage of the cases that we have, and it can have dispositive weight in the cases that we handle. So Mitch, maybe this is a good question for you. What is kind of the history and background of forensic DNA? Well, about 25 years ago in the UK, they had a, two girls that were murdered in two different towns. They were small towns. And those kinds of things going on in any town, obviously, is a huge thing. But in that town, they were both young girls that were on bike paths that were kind of walking home or walking home from work or school and had been raped and murdered. And the, the UK, they did an extensive case on it. They found a young man who was developmentally disabled in one of the villages, indicated that he had killed the one girl but was adamant that he did not kill the other girl. And at the time, there was a professor by the name of Alex Jeffries, who has since become Sir Alex Jeffries. He's been knighted. But uh, he was working on using DNA at the time to sort out uh, if people were related and if they were actually the citizens of Britain. So if someone coming from the UK, I mean coming from India, could they get into the UK? because they were related to a subject, that type of thing. And so they asked him if he could do the work and answer the question. They had a confession, um, but he wouldn't confess to the other case. And so what Alex Jeffries did is he ran the DNA from the two murders. And he came back and told them the same guy did this. Hmm. And he also ran the sample of the young man, and it didn't match him. So they exonerated him. So the very first DNA case back in about 1987 was an exoneration. Then what they did was a massive search for people that lived in that area, for males, to come down and give their blood for DNA. And what happened was a gentleman that worked in a bakery got somebody, hired somebody to go down and take the test for him. His name was Colin Pitchfork because he didn't want to give his sample because he was in fact the murderer. So he did, he paid a man that lived outside the region where they were looking to go in with a false ID and give blood under his name. And uh, he went drinking with a few of his friends after giving the blood, indicated he'd been paid to do that. The fellow employees turned him in and then Colin Pitchfork was captured, the DNA was run and it matched him. Shortly after that, we started using DNA in Denver, uh, probably about the fifth case in the United States. We had to use a private lab. And like Don said, the Denver police had a crime lab, but not a DNA lab. And so in about 1988, I started working on the first DNA case out of Denver. There was one other Denver case that went up to Aspen, which was a serial rapist. He was the Capitol Hill rapist and they actually use DNA up in Aspen. Now, I was the first one to get it in in Denver. And it's kind of just snowballed from there. And what we've tried to do in Denver, and early on we decided, and when I say we, I'm talking about the head of the crime lab now, is that what we would try to do is make 
DNA very common in the criminal cases. So if there was a case it applied in, we would use it or try to use it, and then everybody would get used to it. The judges would get used to it, and like Don said, that's come to pass, mm -hmm. and we see it in a lot of our cases now. We see it in our rape cases, we see it in our murder cases, and we've started a program now that we see it in our property crimes and burglaries, and Don really spearheaded that whole project. And it is widely used now, but I imagine there were some battles you had to fight to be able to use this on this type of basis. Can you talk about some of the battles you've had to deal with um, with the lawmakers and maybe even the, the courts? I stand on Mitch's shoulders in that regard in terms of gaining that general acceptance. I think it's probably, he probably is best situated to talk about that because by the time I came along, it was largely well accepted in the courts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, throughout the 90s, throughout the United States, not just in Denver, but all over the country, uh, they were challenging DNA and saying, hey, you know, you can't use this stuff in court. It's not, it's not admissible. It's not something you can trust. So we spent about t uh, 10 years, really, in different trial courts presenting expert testimony. DNA is basically biology, genetics, and statistics. So we were putting on experts in those three fields, some saying this is absolutely good science and it should be admissible in court. And then there were people that you could hire that would come in and say it wasn't. So we spent a lot of time doing that. And as the systems developed, and there was a huge change in the mid-90s, we went from an entirely, from one DNA system to an entirely different system. And when you do that, you have to go back into court and fight those admissibility hearings. So when Don talks about that, that's pretty much what I spent the 90s doing, is spending an awful lot of court, uh, time in court here and in Adams County and other places where they were challenging it. And we were always successful. But up in Boulder, a judge ruled it to be uh, not valid. That mm -hmm. wasn't one of our cases. And that was the break that we needed because then it was going to go to the Colorado Supreme Court and the Colorado Supreme Court was going to de decide if DNA, the form we're now using, is admissible. Uh, they had already made a decision back on that first case I tried in Denver, uh, the Fishback case, that DNA was valid for identification purposes in a criminal courtroom, but we changed the system. So we went up then um, on another case in the Supreme Court, and uh, we actually wrote an opinion, we wrote a brief to help with that, and Justice Rice actually wrote an incredibly good uh, decision out of the Colorado Supreme Court saying, yes, DNA is admissible, and the way she wrote it was Basically, it's admissible, and as it advances, it's going to continue to be admissible. And that's then what allows Don, and even the case I tried last year where we used DNA, we don't have to fight those fights over and over again. Mm -hmm. Now, Don may have one coming on a statistical issue that I think is going to be coming up, but it's a very technical where you have mixtures, and she's probably going to have to do some admissibility work there. But we're pretty much over that hump when it comes to DNA. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty solid and accepted now. You've also just filed your 100th um, cold case in Denver. Talk a little bit about the significance of that and how important that is and what it means to our community. It was a huge milestone for the cold case unit and the, the ability to reach 100 cases certainly goes past the time when I started to work on these cases in 2006. Some of the cases on that list are cases that Mitch had prosecuted many years ago, but it's so significant because when we talk in the context of this show about cold cases, what we mean is sex assaults and homicides. And so it's the very most serious of the crimes that can be committed against individuals. And so it was a tremendous um, achievement in terms of filing those cases and something that I'd like to, if I may, sort of take that one step further is to talk about the fact that that represents cases that we actually filed as criminal cases in court. Mm -hmm. um, and that means that they, they met our ethical filing standards of, of being, having a likelihood, a reasonable likelihood of conviction at trial. But in addition to that, in the course of the cold case investigations that we've done, we have solved a multiple 
of that number of 100, meaning we have been able to identify the perpetrators in literally hundreds of sexual assaults um, and homicides where perhaps we would recontact the victim and they might not want to reopen that chapter of their lives. And so I see it as a huge component whenever anyone talks about cold cases to talk not only about the achievements of those filed cases, but also to realize the public service that is done when, for instance, you can reach out to the family of a homicide victim and for whatever reason, be it that the suspect is now deceased or perhaps you don't have the evidence to bring the case back to bring filed charges, but to be able to say that to that family, the police department never forgot about your loved one's case and to be able to explain filing standards and, and sometimes, particularly in the case of sexual assaults, to be able to turn to a victim and say, what is it that you would like to do and give deference to those wishes? And many people choose to go forward and they are brave and we respect those decisions. And likewise, we've met with and I have met across the table from many individuals who for their own personal reasons um, did not wish to go forward in a public forum and we were able to honor that as well. And to me, that's a tremendous community service and a function of the cold case investigations. And, and no matter how much time has passed, if that case is still open, it's still gotta be very painful. You know, it, 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 that closing that case must do something emotionally and mentally positive for those victims and the, and the loved ones. Yes, what I hear consistently when we have, it, it is not unusual in a case where I can't meet that ethical filing standard of there being a reasonable likelihood of conviction at trial that the very next step is I, along with representatives from the Denver Police Department's cold case unit, will reach out and if the victims or their families are local, we meet in person and if not, we speak with them over the phone and what I can report from those conversations is that even where we have not been able to put together a filed case, almost to a person, what we hear is that there's a sense of um, satisfaction with the process, a sense of satisfaction that the case did not get forgotten or ignored, and there's a bit of peace of mind that comes along with just knowing that their loved one had not been overlooked, even though years and sometimes decades have passed. Wow, that uh, really does help, I think, in the, the healing process, I would imagine. And we talked about the number of cases you're able to file, but there's also a number of cases that you're not able to file. Talk a little bit more about why that is and maybe an example or two. Well, Tamara, I can give you an example, and then I think Don could really fill in the... Uh, I tried a serial murderer back in the late 80s. His name was Vincent Groves. Vincent Groves had been convicted of murder in Jefferson County, he was convicted, actually it was the early 80s, dates myself, but um, he, we believed had murdered 26 women in the metropolitan wow. area. And so he ended up convicted of three of them and he ended up dying in the penitentiary. Out in Adams County they convicted him, he was also convicted in Douglas County and he was convicted in Jeffco. So he had three murder convictions. He ended up dying in Jefferson County. Well, there was a point in time where Don and the detectives in the cold case unit got to that period of time. And of course, we thought he had killed 26 women. So there were a lot of those cases where if we got DNA on them, we fully expected that they would come back to him but we didn't have his profile, and Don can talk about how that was developed. You've got to have his profile mm -hmm. to match him to the old cases. But there was one in particular that was completely out of the ordinary, and I think it's best to ask Don that. Yeah. But it's another example of some of the cases we've solved but not been able to bring because Mr. Groves is dead. Right. There are still a couple of cases that I believe Vincent Groves is responsible for. They're not in Denver that eventually DNA will match and show that he did kill those women. And then Don has the job of going with the detectives and talking to the families. So to sort of take it from there in terms of the, the way that Vincent Groves got linked to some of these homicides was through the work of a very, very hardworking, um, diligent cold case detective named Detective Milas Yearling, who we each have worked very closely with and he uh, assembled a massive amount of information, investigative information, that related to Mr. Groves. And because he has a very careful eye and a good eye for detail, what he concluded was that there had been a known DNA sample 
that had been taken from Mr. Groves before he died from the Lakewood Police Department. And so using a lot of initiative and resources, he reached out, resourcefulness, he reached out to the Lakewood Police Department. And then after the DNA profile was developed from Mr. Groves' known DNA sample, then it was able to be compared against the number of cases that Detective Yearling, through his own hard work, had identified as being likely candidates where Mr. Groves had been a suspect, whether he had been believed to be a suspect at the original time of the investigation or not. And so after he obtained that known sample, the lab was able to compare those samples, and lo and behold, Mr. Groves' profile was showing up on intimate samples that had been recovered from each of these victims. Um, so it was the very hard work of that detective that linked all of those cases together and something that builds both on what we talked about earlier and with what Mitch was saying um, about, the, about the function of solving these cases even when we can't file them mm -hmm. because a criminal case cannot be filed against a defendant who is deceased. Um, I had the privilege really of being able to communicate with a number of the families to let them know that although we now had certainty that Mr. Groves um, was the perpetrator in their loved one's case that we were not able to proceed to filing and it was a very profound and interesting mm -hmm. experience because in the case of one of those families, Mr. Groves was an utter stranger to their loved one and so this news was utterly surprising to them and they were left with more questions than answers because based on their loved one's daily routines and patterns and social circles, we were mystified about how her path could have ever crossed that of Mr. Groves. On the other hand, one of the other families um, who we met with in person at the Denver Police Department was utterly unsurprised to hear mm -hmm. that we had confirmed that Mr. Groves was the killer, and that's because he had been a prior associate of their loved one, and they had suspected him all along, and indeed they had provided his name many years ago to the police department as a suspect. But the police, even though they had worked very hard, had never been able to link it because they didn't have the benefit back in the late 80s and in the 90s of that DNA evidence that could definitively link him to the victim. Wow, that's pretty powerful for those families, the victims, uh, loved ones. Yes. So how long does it take before a case is actually considered a cold case and then and, and what do you do with it then? Once it's like you put it on a shelf and just kind of go, that's our cold case file, we'll get to it next year. The, there's actually a statutory definition, a definition in the statutes and that we use um, that a cold case is one that has no active leads for a year or more. And in answer to your question about where do the files go or do they remain active, um, I have seen some cases where there have been no active leads for decades and that doesn't mean that they're forgotten, but it just means there hasn't been any fresh information to act on. Mm -hmm. And then also I see cases that literally within a year and a day or so because of the databases connecting um, DNA from scenes to known individuals, sometimes the turnaround on the cases can be rather rapid from a cold case standpoint. So connecting, connecting DNA can just be the tip of the iceberg um, in furthering an investigation, I mean, then the, I wouldn't say the real work, but then more work has to continue. Is that right? There's Yeah, you know, DNA, a lot of people watch TV think DNA, oh, well, he had DNA, obviously. Why did they not file that case? Uh, well, that's just one question. I mean, it, it tells you that you are talking to the right person. Mm -hmm. But then you have to hear, if you can, that person's side of why that DNA is there. So if, for instance, we see it in sexual assaults, and uh, we've had them where we've worked, and sometimes the victim isn't all that cooperative, we get a DNA hit, we go and talk to the male who the DNA, and the male says, wait a minute, it, that woman and I had a relationship that went on for a certain period of time. I never raped her, that was consent. And so we face a lot of issues in court that Don has to analyze in filing a cold case, mm -hmm. a sex assault or a homicide, that are much better, much different than who's the person. Mm -hmm. Because now you know who the person is, now you have to know the circumstances. And sometimes we're only hearing one side of the story, or we're not hearing the story, the, really the complete story at all, because we have a victim that's dead, and we can't really, we don't really know that. So we have an approach that we take when we go and talk to the suspects, if they're willing to talk to us. Uh, but um, that's the nature of the work that you have to do. It, it is, it's a 
you go from a body of all people are your suspects down to one, mm -hmm. and then you've got to go find the circumstances of how that DNA got there. Just one more last quick question. We only question we only have about forty five seconds left. You can also use DNA in solving property crimes and, and uh, those types of crimes too, right? Absolutely, and we do it in huge volume in Denver. Great. So, one last word from you, um, Mitch, in terms of how confident you are about DNA and what this really means to our uh, community as a whole. Well, after those battles we did in the 90s, DNA went from being challenged and being the newest forensic science to being the gold standard. And now what everyone is trying to do is get the other sciences up to the level that DNA met. We met all those bars. Right. This is an incredibly important science. It helps us know who committed crimes. It helps us exonerate innocent people. Saves us a lot of time. Saves us a lot of money. And for us, Don and I, mm -hmm. it convinces us. We know that we have the right person. Uh, when you have DNA, you've got the right person if the circumstances are correct. Gotcha. Well, thanks so much for Thank joining you. us. Thank you to Chief Deputy DA Don Weber for being our guest today with Denver DA Mitch Morrissey on this edition of Dialogue Denver DA. I'm Tamara Banks. We'll see you next time. Denver 8 TV, your city, your source.